I would like to point out that the previous South African flag hanging on the wall behind me is not a political statement. It is simply a piece of history in the background of my first 50 years of life, being born and growing up in my beloved mother country, South Africa. My autobiography, White Zulu, is not a political commentary and frankly describes my experiences of growing up with the Zulu tribe as my family. That flag is simply a piece of cloth signifying the history of South Africa. It was originally used by the Union of South Africa from 1928 to 1961, when I was 11 years old, and later the Republic of South Africa until 1994. No, hello everybody. It's V Tim's here, Viki or the White Zulu, and I have yet another piece for you about my time in Switzerland. Now I have become a member or I have been sent to a real finishing school. And as you recall, I was in Paris with this group of people who were really awful. So I continue with finishing school part two. We were still in the center of Paris trapped by the rioting outside in the boulevards. My fellow travelers, the two girls, were unfriendly, could barely spe speak French, nor even English in Maria's case, and Jane had a permanently sour expression on her face and no sense of humor. I longed for the wicked and dangerous ways of Jonty and Brita, as the, even though they scoffed at the law, at least they'd been fun. Madame Savage persisted in somehow ruining every meal we ate together with some petulant outburst or a very public display, display of sheer bad temper by storming out, chair flying backwards with her sheep-like husband plodding ineffectually behind her, bleating something to appease her, while all the other diners stared at us. The poisonous atmosphere Madame carried around with her spilled over, and on one occasion Jane turned viciously on me during dinner at the hotel and shouted, if you order trout just once more, and I have to sit there for an hour watching you pick at it, I will scream, which tempted me to do it every time just to annoy her. I didn't know, I don't know whether it was the manifestations, the strikes and violence going on throughout Paris which carried on long after we left, that had Madame Savage, Savage in such a vile mood, or that this was just normal for her. Whatever it was, I dreaded every meal. The 1960s cordon bleu, haute cuisine, escoffier style of food was nothing if not daunting from someone who'd lived off Upu to Namasi, sitting outside the huts with our farm staff, our Zulu chef's Masangu's fair, boarding school slop, or Therese's lovely Swiss peasant, plain old rib-sticking food. On these Parisian menus appeared force meats of what? Oeuf Bernadine, mousse, branedade de en moro au voletti. There were short froid sauces, cannelles, truffles, and things in aspic jelly. I didn't know what consomme, 
I didn't know that consomme was a simple, clear soup. Otherwise, I'd have ordered that. Nor did either of the savages enlighten me, as it was sink or swim as far as reading the menus were concerned. Also, anything that required the savages to communicate brought on a monumental fight, so nobody dared ask any questions, however innocent. There were other pitfalls, like frog's legs, escargot, and suggestions of horse meat. Coxcomb appeared on the menus, along with truffles, sauce demi-glace, sauce allemande, Cezanne de Tournado, sauce Mornay, sauce Chaudfroy, fines herbes, sauce Vin Blanc, tomato fondue, and petite marmite, which, since the spelling was the same, naturally I confused with the yeast extract in a jar, and when I made inquiries about having it on toast at one meal, I drew a lambasting from Madame. It turns out that mal meat was a casserole of something. Oh, my Lord, sauce espagnole, poulet de grain, and so many unfathomable dishes appeared everywhere. There was a starter of buttered asparagus tips, which I'd had before, but in South Africa, the only asparagus available was the tinned kind, very flabby, wet and white. We'd only ever eaten that cold with Jenny Post mayonnaise at picnics. And so I pictured that heated in butter and the thought wasn't at all appealing. I don't know why, but the South African climate isn't conducive to growing asparagus, and I'd never heard of the green, crisp kind. If only I'd known, I would have ordered that. The ebullient self-confidence I'd begun to feel, and which the Anshou family had encouraged and nurtured in me, was rapidly eroding. Any feelings of self-worth, which I'd never experienced before, except among my Zulu foster mothers, friends and companions, were being rapidly undermined by the double onslaught of the savages as they turned on me whenever I expressed an opinion. Something which Silet and the others in Chateau Day had always appeared to value, endorse and reinforce. My two young colleagues appeared to be as demoralized as I was becoming, as they had already experienced several terms of this insidious destruction. Our nightmare of a trip finally ended after we'd managed to snatch a very quick trip up the Tour Eiffel, a hasty visit to the Louvre, in a rapid trot through the Notre Dame Cathedral. We had a trip on the River Seine, which was at least on water, not on the burning streets of Paris, and was advised as being safer by our hotel. We spent a morning on a bateau mouche tour. These bateau mouche are open excursion boats and we were wrongly informed that the term translates literally as fly boats because their glass divided viewing covers resemble the compound eyes of flies. As it turns out, the name comes from the fact that they were originally manufactured in boatyards situated in the Mouche area of Lyon. Our tour included a stop on Ile Notre Dame, which really needs a whole day or longer to appreciate the magnificent beauty of the place. But we had about an hour there. 
it was time to leave. And after an uneventful trip back to Switzerland by train, we finally arrived back at Orfontenet, the school, and I, for one, was grateful beyond words to get away from the concentrated, constricting and toxic company of Les Sauvages. The rest of the girls came back to Orfontenet after what had been a three-week break for them. There must have been about 20 of us, although I'd been expecting a lot more, and we only took up half of the dining room. I was the only South African girl there. In fact, I was the only girl from the Southern Hemisphere. I'd rather hoped that there'd be at least some Australian, Kiwi or white Kenyan girls at the school, as I'd met several of them on the slopes of Chateau Day, and they'd always been great fun, noisy, laughing and full of mischief. I'd enjoyed their company enormously. No, apart from Maria, everybody else was European, one English girl, Jane, who already hated me, and the feeling was mutual, and a combination of German and Dutch, Norwegian and others. I don't remember any Italian or French girls, and certainly no Swiss at all. Those all worked there in their various capacities as domestic servants. Jane dropped me like a hot potato the minute the others came back, and apart from greedily demanding my pot of yogurt at breakfast every morning, had no more to do with me. The yogurt thing was simply that I was suspicious of anything to do with milk after my childhood experiences with Mrs. Bannatyne, our governess. That's another story. And even though I loved Amasi, which was yogurt in the form of curdled milk from a calabash, albeit by another name, I wasn't going to touch this little plastic pot of something I didn't recognize. Nobody bothered to explain to me exactly what it was, nor did I think to ask. They just gobbled down theirs. I was seated next to Jane, not by choice, but because we had been told where to sit by Monsieur Savage, and when she saw me leave my yogurt, had asked for it before anybody else did. After that, it became a brief ritual, whereby I handed it over to her without a word, which suited us just fine. She still apparently spoke no French, and none of us was allowed to speak any English, so we all ate mostly in silence. This still unnerved me after the loud, forced chatter I'd been required to maintain at mealtimes for the past six years at school. I felt most uncomfortable in the silence. I had trouble with muesli, too. I'd never before seen this strange, dry combination of raw oats and God knows what else, perhaps bird seed, with what I assumed was shriveled up dried fruit in it, but looked more like rat's droppings. Again, it didn't occur to me to ask what it was, so I left that as well and breakfasted as I had at St. Anne's, mainly on whatever fruit was available. But there were not many filling and satisfying bananas, oranges, naches, avocados, mangoes, or pawpaws. In the Northern Hemisphere, at that time of the year, there were only hard, sour little green apples available. Nothing like the lovely, sweet and juicy cape apples I was familiar with. 
There wasn't anything hot like mealy meal or multibellad porridge, which I'd so enjoyed at home, nor were there any of Therese's delicious hot croissants and other fresh rolls that she'd always provided as a hearty breakfast for hungry skiers. There didn't seem to be any structure to the days. Mercifully, I hardly ever saw the savages again. They didn't eat with us, nor did they involve themselves in any of our lessons. They simply evaporated although now and again I'd catch a glimpse of Madame driving out of the gates in her sporty little silver two-seater car, sometimes suspiciously late in the evenings, on her way to the hairdresser's or nail salon, I assume, as she never brought anything as demeaning as, demeaning as groceries back with her. Monsieur shut himself away in his office and had nothing to do with us either. We did have cookery lessons. There was an elaborately laid out kitchen with many large stations fully equipped with gas burners, electric ovens and every copper pan and spatula known to man. All provided especially to teach us cordon bleu cuisine, and those lessons were constructive. This type of cooking class was at the opposite end of the cookery spectrum to the domestic science classes I'd endured at school. We had the finest ingredients and a pleasant Swiss French chef who encouraged us to create wonderful cheese souffles, my favourite, and other familiar, well, and the familiar truite aux amandes, and so many delicious classics. I found I was enjoying myself under chef's tutelage and blossomed into a confident cook, even though I'd had no real grounding. I can't count what we did at St. Anne's as cooking, especially the invalid cookery, which was sickening enough to have made anyone ill, let alone give to some unfortunate and luckily imaginary patient. And since our Zulu, Zulu chef Masangu chased us out of the kitchen, with his lethally sharp butcher's knife, if we ever dared stick our heads around the corner of his domain, I hadn't learnt any bad habits. I was virgin territory as far as imaginative cuisine was concerned, and cunning chef, seeing my potential as an inspired cook, nurtured me as a special project. He was rewarded with a star pupil, and I started to think I might take up haute cuisine as a career later on. Unfortunately, just the idea of breaking the news to my parents that I was even thinking of becoming something as demeaning as a chef was enough to make me shudder. There was nothing ladylike about cooking, according to mum and dad. That's what one ha had servants for. All a South African housewife would be expected to do was dictate to one's own chef what the day's menu would be, just as mum did with Masangu, if she remembered to. Otherwise, he was left to use his own initiative. That is all for the time being, and there's more to come next week. I would like to thank John Moslane for putting aside his Friday afternoons to help me produce these videos. Without him, I could not do this. I would also like to thank Sean van Furen for his sterling work in uploading my videos to my YouTube channel adding the photos 
as well as managing my channel so professionally. If you would like to know more about my other works, I have written five books in all, and each one is autobiographical. Please visit my website at www.whitezulubook.com where you will find a lot more information as well as plenty of photographs. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed my life story and there is plenty more to come. A thumbnail photo will be attached each week. And thank you so much for all your support and all the very kind remarks you make um, in complimenting me on my work. I really appreciate it. Goodbye.